Does truth exist? Because you have faith, does that make this book true? Does God exist? So when someone says there is no truth, if you apply the claim to itself, what should you say? Is that true? They don't think Christianity is true. They're talked out of it. You know why they're talked out of it? Because they've never been talked into it. Cross-examining skeptical and atheistic views. Welcome to Cross-Examine with Dr. Frank Turek. Paul is upset. He's really upset. Normally when he opens a book, he goes through a real long introduction, a lot of flowery language. language. He's, he's making nice with people. He doesn't do that at all in the book of Galatians. After a, a very short salutation, he says this to the Galatian church. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if an angel, or he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach another gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be under God's curse. Now, can you imagine getting a letter from somebody and he starts that way? That's what Paul did to the church in Galatia. Why? Because they were abandoning the true gospel for another gospel. And that's what's going on in our culture, in our churches right now. And thankfully, God has risen someone up to come to the rescue. Her name is Elisa Childers. Many of you know Elisa because she's uh, substituted for me on this podcast. If you've listened to this podcast for a while, she's done a few shows for us already. But you might also know her because she was one of the original Zoe girls back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Since then, she's become not only a wife and a mom, but an author, a blogger, a speaker. She's been a worship leader, as you know. And uh, this brand new book that she just wrote is called Another Gospel. And this is more important, ladies and gentlemen, than atheism in America. It's more important than Islam in America right now, especially in the church, because many people are abandoning the true gospel for another gospel, another gospel called progressive Christianity. Elise is going to take us through this and help us understand it and also help us what we can do about it if we think our church or people that we love are beginning to become what are called progressive Christians. So it's always great to have Elisa on. Elisa, how are you? Hey, Frank, it's always great to be with you. Well, it's even greater to be with you because this is a great book. I read it six months ago when you sent it to me in order to uh, to uh, endorse it. And immediately I said, wow, this is a fabulous book. And uh, there's so much in here. It starts with your own story. Why don't you kind of give us a quick overview of what happened to you? Here you are growing up. You're a Christian. You become a a a, a world renowned recording artist. You're singing Christian songs and then you get involved in a church. that starts to pull you away from Orthodox Christianity. How did that happen? Yeah, well, I had spent the better part of a decade touring with Zoe Girl, as you mentioned before. And so around the time that the group came off the road, uh, we were all married by this time and starting to have children. And so I was kind of still feeling the itch to do music. And so I did some solo music and was invited to um, at a local church just right here in the heart of Middle Tennessee, where I live. And we loved this church. So my husband and I just felt this instant connection with the people who were really accepting of us, just very non-judgmental, very welcoming. We loved the pastor's intellectual approach to the sermons because neither of us had really been exposed to something like that before. So we began attending this church. And after about eight months, the pastor invited me to be a part of a smaller group. And he compared it with seminary. He said, this will be essentially a four-year class, very small class, that at the end of this four years, you'll come out on the other side with a seminary level education. And so we were going to be reading books and discussing different theological topics and ministry topics. And so I was really excited to take part in this class. And so uh, at one of the first classes, the pastor revealed that he was actually agnostic. And now, mind you, in this class, we weren't really supposed to talk outside the class, what was going on inside the class. And so he was basically letting us know that he was going through quite a bit of doubt about the truthfulness of Christianity. And so 
over the course of about four months, which is how long I lasted in the class, everything I'd ever believed about the gospel in Jesus and the Bible was really deconstructed. It was picked apart with many things discarded by many of my classmates. And so it sent me into a really dark time of doubt where uh, all of the doubts that were planted in this class just really took root in my own heart and grew. And so I found myself just drowning in doubt. And thankfully, God used apologetics to help rebuild my faith. But the church went on to identify itself as a progressive Christian community. And so that's when I first encountered that phrase and really learned that this is a movement that's growing in the church. Elisa, I'm curious. I don't even if you know the answer to this. Why did he just invite you and not you and Mike, your husband? Any idea? That's an interesting uh, point. In one of the first times we met, there were lots of people, some were couples, some were individuals, but he said, everybody who's here, you're a peculiar person in some way. And I think that he, what he was getting at is that he discerned in some way that this select group of people he chose were out of the box thinkers that maybe were, were open to rethinking Christianity. They were open to reinterpreting some things and maybe rejecting some things. So I think it was probably stri uh, tri strategic in that sense, because I had been writing songs that were expressing some, you know, criticism of e certain aspects of evangelical culture. And so I think he latched onto that and invited me as opposed to both of us, because I don't know if he saw that in Mike, honestly. So um, I, I think that's probably why. Now. I know this is going to be hard to define because what we what they call progressive Christianity is hard to define. But if you had to maybe enumerate some of the key beliefs of of progressive Christianity, what would they be? And you're right. It is hard to define because largely it's characterized by not so much that people are assessing the claims of progressive Christianity and saying, yeah, we believe that this reflects reality. We think that these claims are true. It's more of a reaction against whatever kind of evangelical uh, stream of the church they grew up in. And so it's, it's progressive Christians are not creedal in the sense that they're unified around creeds or certain beliefs. It's much more about what you do than what you believe. But as I researched this movement and read the books and read the blog posts and listened to the podcasts, it really became evident that there really are some really core doctrines that all of the progressive Christians that I've read and listened to would agree upon. And so those would be, number one, it would have to do with the Bible. And so historically, Christians have seen the Bible as authoritative for our lives, that it's the word of God, it's inspired by God. I, we've argued over interpretation, certainly, and, and things like that. But speaking, and especially going back to the earliest Christians, the scripture was the bedrock of how they based their beliefs, even that early creed in 1 Corinthians 15, it, it mentions twice that these beliefs are in accordance with the scriptures. So the scriptures have been such an important part of the, the Christian life. But in progressive Christianity, the Bible is more seen like a spiritual travel journal. So in progressive Christianity, we can look back at what our spiritual ancestors believed about God in the times and the places in which they lived, but these writers of the Bible are not necessarily speaking for God. And so if you look at an Old Testament passage where someone says, God says, or uh, the, thus saith the Lord, in the progressive view, they're just giving their best idea about who God is, but that's not necessarily God talking. So that would be the first thing would be the Bible. And then the way they view the cross is, you, if we look at the historic view being that Jesus died for our sins as a sacrifice, uh, as our substitute to pay the price for our sins. In the progressive view, this makes God into a cosmic child abuser, the idea that the father would require mm. the blood sacrifice of his son. Well, and of course, if you remove the Bible and any meaningful mechanism for atonement, what kind of a gospel is that going to leave you with? So in progressive Christianity, it's much more of a works-based social justice gospel than a sin and redemption gospel. And we're going to get into more of those details right after the break. You're listening to I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist with Frank Turk. My guest today is Elisa Childers and his and her new book you absolutely need to get is called Another Gospel. Trust me, it's excellent. We're going to talk more about it right after the break. Don't go away. We're back in just two minutes. 
Friends, can you help me with something? Can you go up to iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast and give us a five-star review? Why? It will help more people see this podcast and therefore then hear it. So if you could help us out there, I'd greatly appreciate it. Welcome back to I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist with Frank Turk on the American Family Radio Network. Our website is crossexamined.org, but you need to check out a new website. Well, newer than crossexamined.org, alisachilders.com. Alisachilders.com. Alisa is my guest today with her brand new fabulous book called Another Gospel. Trust me, you need to get this book, not just because it's very, very prevalent right now in some Christian churches, uh, but also because it is an apologetics book as well. As Elisa went through her own period of doubt, period of doubt, she began to get answers and included some of the answers she got in the book Another Gospel. So it's part kind of almost autobiographical and part apologetics book. So it makes for a very interesting and fast read that you'll learn a lot from. Elisa, before the break, you were saying that a couple of the tenets, if you will, uh, of of the progressive Christians, although it's hard to figure out what their doctrine, you know, they have a doctrine that they don't have doctrine, but yes, <laughs> but, but they really do have a doctrine. So one, the Bible isn't really the word of God. It might contain sort of words of God, but it's it's not the kind of, of document that is inerrant, perhaps, as, as we might say. Also, secondly, you said that they, they reject the atonement because they think mm-hmm. it's divine child abuse. Question, by what standard would they judge this as divine child abuse? Exactly. Well, and that's kind of the, the trap the atheists fall into as well, yeah. is by, by not having a moral standard, a, an objective moral standard, yet still having uh, just the the audacity really to sort of imply that God is somehow immoral for the way that he does things. But yeah, this this whole idea of the atonement being cosmic child abuse is sort of like building blocks. So if you go back through the progressive Christian theology, even going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, they're not going to think that it's the sin that separates us from God. So in progressive Christian sermons, what you'll often hear is that it's not sin that separates us from God. It's it's just our own shame or, or our own lack of realizing how beloved we are. Mm-hmm. And so you can kind of see that if they don't really believe that we're separated from God by sin, well, it would seem kind of horrific for God to require a blood sacrifice of his only son. And, and so it's sort of like these building blocks that, that get put on top of each other. And so by the time you get to the atonement, this is just roundly rejected in the progressive church. And so in the progressive view, they might say, well, Jesus died to show us forgiveness, or he died to satisfy our bloodlust that we were, we wanted our pound of flesh. So God submitted to it and gave it to us. But ultimately he did that to break the power of sin and death, which sort of hints at a Christus Victor view, but it's, it's not a fully orbed Christus Victor view. It's more of a moral influence view with a little bit of Christus Victor thrown in, but definitely with a rejection of the substitutionary atonement of, of Jesus. How or why would it be considered immoral if the being who sacrificed is God himself and he volunteers to be sacrificed? Right. I think that that's an aspect that gets missed in the progressive church. And again, just if we look at this like building blocks, uh, generally speaking, in the progressive movement, you have this view of Jesus that goes along with, it's really a new age view called cosmic Christ. And this is something that Richard Rohr teaches. And he's considered a spiritual mentor by Rob Bell and Jen Hatmaker and several of the major players of this movement. And he teaches that Jesus and Christ are two separate entities. And so Jesus essentially laid hold of this office of the Christ and achieved that as an example for us to follow. So we can do that too. And although Richard Rohr would probably not outright say Jesus isn't God, he hints at that by saying things like, Jesus never asked to be worshipped. And so that view kind of trickles down, I think, to a weakened view of the Trinity. And so when you get to cosmic child abuse and, and this idea, they're seeing Jesus almost as this whipping boy that gets pulled out against his will. He's this victim. And, you know, God is this mean bully in the sky and requires this. 
But but you're right. What's what's missed in that view is this robust view of the Trinity that Jesus, no, he said, nobody takes my life, but I willingly lay it down. He identified himself as the suffering servant from Isaiah 53 in the upper room the night before he was betrayed. This wasn't just some hapless victim that didn't know what was going on or, or that he didn't want it to be going on. It was his will. He says, I willingly do this. And so I think you're right. A robust view of the Trinity is the best way to take a different look at cosmic child abuse. It becomes less cosmic child abuse and more of a self-sacrifice of a loving God. Yeah, a story I tell a lot is of a Navy SEAL named Michael Monsor who willingly sacrificed his life to save his two friends. There was no other way to save them because there was a grenade right between them and he jumped on it. And mm. I can't see anybody saying that that, was, that wasn't anything but loving. And of right. course, God, being a infinitely just, can't be unjust. He can't allow us to go unpunished. So what does he do? He finds somebody else to punish who's innocent, and that's himself. Well, I don't understand that's why right. this is considered controversial at all. But right. apparently, maybe they don't understand it. At least I don't know. But yeah, there is a disconnect from the reality of how all of these theological points fit together. And it's interesting that you mentioned Galatians in your opening. Because in Galatians 3, Paul says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And I think that describes the progressive movement so well, because it's, it's like this spell comes over people and they can't connect the dots anymore. And it's like this, um, this bewitching that's happening to the church. Hmm. And it's like they're being seduced into this easier gospel that culture is going to feel great about. You know, if you're a progressive Christian, culture is going to love you. They're going to love the things you stand for. They're going to support your moral stances, the the sexuality that you promote. And so I, I think it's kind of like what Paul was dealing with, where, where you just want to say, oh, progressive Christians, who has bewitched you? Yeah. And you and I have spoken about this for a while now. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Elisa is also an instructor for us at CIA, the cross Examine Instructor Academy. She once was a student, but she was so good being a student. You're better than some of our instructors. You need, <laughs> you need to be an instructor. So she's an instructor now. And I know... I don't know who makes up these terms, but first of all, I object to progressive and I object to, to Christian because mm. these people are neither. <laughs> they are. Yeah, no, I agree. Any, anytime that you are, you are regressing if you're getting away from Jesus, you're not progressing. And secondly, if you're not adhering to the fundamentals of Christianity, you're not a Christian. An example I like to give is suppose we all were with Moses at the bottom of Mount Sinai, he comes down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, and we look at those ten and we go, you know, Moses, we don't really like those ten. We have our own ten. Should we call ourselves followers of Yahweh? Right. Of course not. You know, we have our own different set of, of moral rules we're going to live by, so we wouldn't be called followers of Yahweh. We're rejecting Yahweh. So why do we allow these people to call themselves progressive Christians? Because they're not Christians. Right. And this is a big question I get all the time where people say if they've basically come to the conclusion that core essential doctrines of the historic Christian faith are not true, why are they still calling themselves progressive Christians? Mm -hmm. And I think that the answer to that is that in many, in many ways, there are progressive Christians who think that what we would consider to be historic Christianity is wrong. They'll teach that when Constantine legalized Christianity and then you had the wedding of the church and the state together, that Christianity went off the rails. And in their minds, they're actually trying to reclaim it and bring it back to its roots. But the, the thing that's so interesting about when they start talking about what that looks like, and I'll just use Brian McLaren as an example, mm -hmm. when he talks about the gospel, which by the way, he calls the historic Christian gospel, this idea of the fall and then man being separated from God by sin, Jesus offering redemption for that. And then there being a final judgment where there will be eternal destinations of heaven or hell. He calls this pagan. He says, this is imported from Greek philosophy, from Plato and from Aristotle. And so he says, we need to get back to a Jewish view of the gospel, which he believes is what Jesus was preaching. But what's so fascinating about when he actually presents 
his more Jewish gospel is it sounds just like um, like the left news outlets of 2020. They're talking <laughs> about green energy reform and socio The gospel reform according and- to CNN. Exactly. And so it's just like interesting that he would say that's actually the Jewish gospel when it really sounds like today's headlines. Now, Elisa, you did some research on this because you wanted to get back to historic Christianity prior to even Constantine, back to the first, second, third centuries of Christianity. And uh, you actually read some of the, the great skeptics of Christianity, like Bart Ehrman. And what did you conclude that they concluded about historic Christianity? Yeah, that's a good question, because when I was really rocked by doubt, I wanted to know, first of all, what the definition of Christianity was and made sure that I had that right, because so many of my friends were walking away from the faith that they grew up with. They were walking away from the denomination they grew up in. And I wanted to make sure that if I'm walking away from Christianity, that I actually have it identified and defined properly. So I went all the way back to the earliest sources. I didn't know this at the time, but I learned that our New Testament contains dozens of creeds that predate those New Testament books, in some cases, by uh, 20 years or so. Mm. And so the arguably what's the earliest creed in all of Christianity uh, says that Jesus died for our sins. It talks about the bodily resurrection of Jesus. It talks about this all being in accordance with the Jewish scriptures. And interesting that you mentioned Bart Ehrman, because I didn't want to just look for confirmation bias. I didn't want to just find somebody that agreed with me and make myself feel better and then move on. I wanted to know what everybody thought about this. And so I did. I I subscribed to Bart Ehrman's blog. I, I read one of his books. And interestingly, even in one of his blog posts, he was talking about that very creed. And he said, this was Christianity in a nutshell. So in That's other 1 words, Corinthians you have, 15, by the way, 15, 3, yes, 8. For the, go ahead. That's sorry, go right. Ahead. And, and Bart Ehrman, this famous skeptic, agnostic, atheist scholar who left the faith is saying, this is the definition of what Christianity was to the earliest Christians. And when I'm looking at that creed, I'm seeing a really robust belief statement. This isn't just some vague, you know, Jesus death, resurrection of Jesus. This is, he died for a reason. And that was for our sins. You have the seedbed of substitutionary atonement there. And then you have the bodily resurrection, the proof of Jesus being buried, the eyewitnesses that saw him and all of this being connected with the authority and the inspiration of the old Testament scriptures. And so what I found was a really robust definition that was even, uh, uh, affirmed by skeptical and even atheistic scholars. We're talking to Elisa Childers, her brand new book just out last week, Another Gospel. I and many other people have endorsed this book because it's really tremendous. As I say, it's part autobiographical, part uh, apologetics book. It's an easy, fun read, and it's a very relevant read for today. In fact, after the break, we're going to see how just how relevant it is. So don't go anywhere. I'm Frank Turek. You're listening to I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist with Frank Turek back in just two minutes. If you find value in the content of this podcast, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Join our online community to have great conversations, grow in your knowledge of God, and become a better defender of the Christian faith. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we have hundreds of videos and over 100,000 subscribers that are part of our online family. Find us by searching for Frank Turek or cross-examine in the search bar. You can find many more resources like articles, online courses, free downloadable materials, event calendars, and more at crossexamined.org. Last week, I mentioned I'd be at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills with the great Jack Hibbs this weekend. Turns out this week we had to alter our plan. So the great Jack Hibbs will be preaching at Chino Hills this weekend. I will be out there, Lord willing, on November 15th. So if you're out in the Southern California area, I hope to see you there. Uh, I'll be out in Tucson next week. Uh, There is an apologetics conference at Calvary Chapel, Tucson. You can check our website for that. I'll be out there with Mike Lacona and with Jay Warner Wallace and with uh, Doug Axe and a whole bunch of other great people, Greg Kokel. So uh, that's in Tucson, Arizona next weekend. 
And after that, uh, where am I going to be after that? I don't know. I'll tell you next week. <laughs> so well, right now I'm supposed to be with Elisa Childers talking about her great new book, Another Gospel. And Elisa, before the break, we were, were talking about how relevant this book is right now because this topic is very relevant. There are many people in the evangelical church, or at least some anyway, that are drifting into what has been called progressive Christianity, despite the fact that we dispute the title. Um, what are some signs that people can identify in others to say this person is drifting into this kind of theology? I think that's an important question because progressive Christianity is such a subtle shift. It's not like overnight a church is going to take down its belief statement and replace it with a new one and say, hey, we are a progressive Christian church now. It's usually years of a slow drift away from historic Christian doctrine. So I think looking for signs is a really good approach to identify if you think this movement might be infiltrating your church or if someone you know or you love might be falling for its claims. And so the first thing you're going to look for, I would start with the gospel. So a, a historically Christian church should be preaching the gospel uh, every Sunday, you should be hearing references to the atonement, to uh, God's plan of redemption for mankind, to reconcile man to himself. If if that sort of gets sidelined and you're hearing a lot more talk that sounds like culture's definitions of justice, of social justice, and things along those lines where the real gospel is getting sidelined in favor of social justice, that would be something to look for. Now, of course, Christians, if we have put true faith in Jesus, our our salvation will bear fruit and we will be doing good works in the world. But when that takes center stage over the gospel, I, I think that would be a, a warning sign to look for. Another warning sign to look for would be a shift on sexuality and issues that have to do with same-sex marriage. So if your church is rethinking those issues, if they're saying, well, we're not sure the church has gotten this right, or uh, we think it's okay to be actively gay and a Christian, that would be a huge sign that your church has slipped into this progressive Christian movement. Another sign to look for would be biblical authority being shifted onto personal feelings. So if you hear people say things like, well, I read Paul, but it doesn't really resonate with me. Or I think Paul had biases and prejudices that affected what he put down in his epistles. Or if you hear somebody say, well, I just couldn't believe in a God who could send people to hell uh, because I wouldn't do that. So mm. I, I, I wouldn't think God would do something that I wouldn't even do. Am I even more moral than God? You would hear people say things like that. There would be a willingness to re-examine core historic Christian doctrines. Like we mentioned cosmic child abuse. If the atonement starts to be identified as a as an abusive type of doctrine. That would be a huge red flag. Uh, other other ways it it kind of seeps in is with uh, redefining certain terms. So if they're using words like biblical authority and inspiration, but in practice not really practicing those words the way they've historically meant, where divine inspiration might take on the meaning of it's inspiring to me, or it inspires deeper faith in me. But that's not historically what Christians have meant by divine inspiration in regard to the scriptures. So those would just be some, some signs to look for. Is that it? Is that all you got, Elisa? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I can go on. You could, I know. <laughs> go to elisachilders.com and get the book, Another Gospel. But out of all those things you just mentioned, it seems to me there's one there's one new belief system that seems to be universal among all so-called progressive Christians, and that is a complete relaxation of sexual ethics to the point where people get to do whatever they want practically sexually. I, yes. I don't think I've ever seen a situation where that wasn't really the motivating factor beyond uh, behind it. Now, motivation alone, of course, doesn't prove whether something's true or false, but motivation can help you discover why people are moving in a particular direction. Uh, they're moving away from the Christian ethic. They are disagreeing with Jesus, which tells me, why would you call yourself a Christian if you're disagreeing with Jesus? What, do, you th do you think that's the primary motivation or are there other motivations? I definitely think it's one of the primary motivations and it's it's 
and that's not the only thing they disagree with Jesus about. They actually disagree with Jesus about quite a few things. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that when you listen to the different deconstruction stories, there are podcasts dedicated to giving airtime to people telling their deconstruction stories and they're um, leaving the evangelical church. And I have never yet heard one that didn't at least reference this extreme discomfort with the historical biblical ethic on sexuality. And I think particularly for younger Christians, uh, millennial and Gen Z, where the cultural pressure is so extreme. It's not just that they're being called names. It's not just that they're being called a bigot or hateful. They're actually being told that if you ascribe to the biblical ethic on sexuality, you're actually hurting people. You're causing depression. You're causing suicide. And so it has brought about this complete reworking of the sexual ethic. In fact, um, a couple of years ago, a progressive Lutheran minister, Nadia Boltz Weber, wrote a book called Shameless. And in that book, she argues that the the sexual ethic of Christians doesn't just need a few tweaks, but it actually needs to be burnt to the ground and we need to start completely over. And Mm. so she starts by defining holiness as unity between either two people or a person and God, which gives her the right to call any kind of sexual union holy. So she describes a situation where this uh, same-sex couple has a one-night stand, and she calls it holy. And so she gives everybody permission to basically whatever you think is going to make you thrive sexually, whatever you think is going to make you make you feel better, whatever's going to make you feel happy and free and affirmed, you can do that. And you can actually not just say that it's okay by God, but you can actually say that it's holy. And this book was endorsed by uh, a veritable who's who of progressive Christianity. It was uh, uh, by a uh, I think Rachel Held Evans and Brian McLaren and Austin Channing Brown, major voices in the progressive movement are saying, we endorse this book and it's about time. So isn't it interesting, Elisa, that these are the folks and you you write about it in, uh, I think it's in chapter four, maybe, uh, about how this actually, this progressive Christianity actually has its roots in Marxism and mm. the fact that people who may be considered orthodox or conservative are the oppressors. Mm -hmm. And if, if you say that say same sex relationships are against God's will, now you're an oppressor, but isn't it interesting that now they oppress those who hold the orthodox or conservative view of the Bible. They're not tolerant of conservative orthodox believers. They think we are wrong. So look, if disagreement means oppression, then they are the new oppressors. You know, oppression yes. oppression hasn't gone away. Only the oppressors have changed. So they're doing exactly what they claim uh, conservative Christians are doing. They are they have a doctrine and they're trying to impose that doctrine on other people. That's right. In fact, Frank, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say this is one of the most intolerant groups I've ever encountered. Mm. I I interact with all kinds of different people online and social media. Um, atheists. Now there, there are some stinkers out there, atheists, of course, as you know, uh, but very often an atheist will come along with a respectful dialogue about something. But in the progressive Christian movement, because they have so ascribed to this, uh, it's really an ideology called critical theory. Like you mentioned that views people in two groups and two groups only, and that's oppressed and oppressor. And you're either in the oppressed group or you're an oppressor. And sometimes those different, and it runs on class uh, lines of class and gender and uh, race and all kinds of different variables, uh, ability, things like this. Uh, but because they're ascribing to these secular definitions, they can't parse between, say, racial discrimination and sexual discrimination. Mm -hmm. It's all the same. You're either oppressed or you're the oppressor. And so that's why the biblical sexual ethic is not just seen as outdated or archaic, but it's actually seen, like you mentioned, as oppressive. That that the idea that one man and one woman uh, married for a lifetime is seen as oppressive. In fact, in Nadia Boltzweber's book, she talks about even the idea that we would encourage young people to wait until marriage to have sex. She says that stunts their sexual flourishing and basically 
hinders them from having a fulfilled life in that area as they get older. Wow. And so it's, it's very much, it is rooted in Marxism and it takes on a, a bit of a different flavor today as we see, but that really does become their gospel. And so you hear a lot of progressive voices saying that whatever dominant voices, like, you know, when we look at truth, we've always said as apologists and as people who love objective truth and absolute truth, it doesn't matter where it's coming from. If it's true, it's true. But that's not the case in the progressive church. If you're a white male, especially like a, a middle-aged white male, they do not want to hear what you have to say, whether you're speaking something that's true or not. Now, what could be more racist than that? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, I know. They're, they're doing exactly the opposite of what maybe they intend to do <laughs> by yeah. saying certain people with certain sin, skin colors can't have an opinion. It, it's just it's just rank racism. It's just amazing to me. It's also uh, amazing to me that, again, these people claim to be Christians, but they're disagreeing with Jesus. So maybe we ought to bring some Jesus's uh, teachings into this right now. First of all, he said... It's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out of a man. And one of the things he mentions is sexual immorality and sexual immorality in, in his day was any sex outside of the marriage between a man and a woman. And so Jesus would not agree with them on their sexual ethic. So if you want to say you can have sex with anybody um, and it's just fine, well, go right ahead. But don't say Jesus approves of it because he doesn't and he didn't. Uh, yeah. That's that's really the pro and one of the reasons he doesn't approve of it is because sex is like fire. You put fire, you, know, you put fire in your fireplace. It's wonderful. You get anywhere else in your house, it will burn your house down. It's not just a physical relationship. There's so much more to it. But I'm preaching now, Elisa, and I don't want to do that because yeah. we're talking about your book, and we're going to come <laughs> right back. The book is called Another Gospel. Elisa Childers is my guest. The book came out last week. You need to get it. Top book on Amazon in apologetics. It's part autobiography, part apologetics. Wonderful read. You'll enjoy it. You'll get a lot out of it because you'll get insights that you probably didn't have, particularly on what's going on in some of our churches today. So we're back in just two minutes. Don't go anywhere. Friends, Frank Turek here. I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is a listener-supported radio program and podcast. So if you like what you hear here, would you consider donating to crossexamined.org? 100% of your donations go to ministry, 0% to buildings. We're completely virtual. So if you can help us out, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Welcome back to I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist with Frank Turek on the American Family Radio Network. And if you're low on the FM dial looking for NPR, go no further because we're actually going to tell you the truth here. I can guarantee you're not going to hear this on NPR. We're talking about progressive Christianity with my friend Elisa Childers. Her new book is Another Gospel. You need to get it. Trust me. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, we were just just before the break talking about the the lack of sexual ethic or maybe the complete reversal of sexual ethic almost in the progressive church from what Jesus said. Jesus also said this. He said, the truth will set you free. What does that imply? If you don't have the truth, you're in bondage. Getting into sexual sin doesn't make you free. It puts you into bondage. And Jesus says, if you don't have the truth, you don't accept the truth, you are in bondage. So we should, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, at least agree with the words of Jesus. And unfortunately, people now calling themselves progressive Christians don't agree with Jesus and actually contradict Jesus. So it's my opinion they ought not call themselves Christians. But Elisa, in this last segment, I definitely want to get into, if we can, I know you have this in the book, Another Gospel, but how do people who are Christians, conservatives, how do they reach people who maybe have now gone into this progressive Christianity theology? What, what can they do? This is a question I receive quite a bit uh, through my website and on social media. And I think there's a couple of things that people can bear in mind, uh, especially with progressive Christianity, which is so relativistic. It's, it's a very postmodern reaction mm -hmm. to the, the rationalism that's come before. So, so they don't like truth claims they don't like dogma, even though except LGBTQ on, <laughs> is OK. And if you disagree with us, we're going to oppress you. Other than that, everything's it, fine. Exactly. <laughs> it, well, and that's the thing is that it's they don't like other people 
bringing dogma, but it is a very dogmatic movement for sure, mm-hmm. without a doubt. But uh, because progressive Christianity is so reactionary, I mentioned this in another segment, it's not so much that people have looked at this movement and said, hey, I've assessed these claims. I think this is true. I think this reflects reality. I'm all in. It's really more of a a hodgepodge because it's a reactionary movement where people are reacting against whatever stream of Christianity they grew up in. And so I think the first thing that people should do when they're trying to reach people who are swayed by this is to try and understand why. There's, There's a lot of different motives for people to go into this movement. I mean, there are things as simple as old-fashioned rebellion on sexual ethics, where they're saying, basically, I just can't hang with the historic Christian ethic anymore. And so it can just be something as simple as that. But it can also be something a bit more complicated, where maybe they encountered some legitimate abuse in the sect that they grew up in, or the small church that they grew up in. Or maybe they encountered hyper-fundamentalism. I've known people who were told that they were going to go to hell if they were caught in a movie theater when the rapture happened. And so they're they're reacting against that legalism. Or perhaps they, you know, prayer is a big deal in the progressive church. A lot of people who might have grown up with a bit of the prosperity gospel, they were told, you're never supposed to be sick. You're never supposed to to have trouble. God will deliver you out of all of those things if you put your faith in him. And then somebody they love dies of cancer and they are disillusioned. And so they go over into this progressive movement. So I think that's the first thing to keep in mind is that there's usually a wound there. And then the second thing I would say is to to get ready for the long haul, because this is like nailing jello to a wall. It's not going to be quick. It's probably not going to be overnight. And it's going to take relationship. It's going to take a lot of very cleverly well-placed questions rather than dogmatic statements. And of course, you've had Greg Kopel on your show, Frank, to talk about tactics. Tactics is a great book that really applies to the progressive Christian movement, because if you can ask somebody a question, everybody loves to talk about themselves, and then you're disarming uh, the, the confrontation to make it more conversational and more of a discipleship thing that can go on for a, a long time and just showing them a lot of love and acceptance of who they are as people uh, with, you don't have to accept what they believe, but showing them love and acceptance uh, without compromising, I think are, are some good things to keep in mind because again, this, these are people who are hurt for, for one reason or another in generally speaking. You know, the question, as you know, I like to ask to atheists is, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Of course, that could be modified to say, if Jesus rose from the dead, would you follow him and see what they say? But for, you could ask that of a a so-called progressive Christian, but I think you could also ask a question like this. Um, If Jesus really did sacrifice himself for you, and he wanted you to refrain from certain sexual behaviors, would you obey him? Yeah. And I wonder what kind of answer you'd get. And I think Uh, going to Jesus is a good idea because progressive Christians generally, they don't like Paul. I mean, you're you're not going to get anywhere if you just start out by quoting one of Paul's epistles. But if you go Mm -hmm. to Jesus and say, look, I know you love Jesus, so let's start there. And you can even help uncover the fact that they might just be worshiping a Jesus they've made in their own image and try to, you know, because we see all of these different points where progressives do disagree with Jesus, maybe pointing out what Jesus actually said about something can, can get you a little bit further down the road. Sure. And I, going back to the atonement issue, you might ask them, why do you think Jesus came to earth? I mean, new yeah. morals, was that it? Well, there were some morals in the Old Testament. Uh, what was it? And of course, he says he came to give his life as a ransom. Do you agree with yeah. that or not? <laughs> right? Right. Um, yeah. So those are some questions I think you could ask. Uh, Greg's question is great, too. The question where he says, do you consider yourself a tolerant person? You know, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you ask that question, yes. you know, oh, of course I'm tolerant. Okay, well, great, because if I have a different view on sexuality than you do, you'll 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 be tolerant of me, Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and these are very, and that's why the book is called Tactics, because they are really good tactics to mm-hmm. use to keep a conversation going. But I think, I think that asking them even a, another good question about Jesus is to just say, 
where do you get your information about Jesus? Mm. And I've even asked progressive Christians this before, and I've, I've had some respond with a kind of a weak Bible answer, like maybe I read something about it in the Bible when I was younger, or they might even just be so bold as to say, well, it's the Jesus as he reveals himself to me uh, every day. In fact, Brian Zond in his book on the atonement, where he argues against the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. At the very end of the book, he basically reveals that he sat with Jesus and Jesus basically told him how to interpret all of this. And so he's created this God in his own image that you go through this whole book and you're reading all of these different interpretations only to find out it was based on him just saying he sat with Jesus and Jesus basically told him this new thing. And so when when you have that, I think even just un- uncovering some of that can put some pebbles in their shoes to get them to think a little more like, well, wait, if I'm just creating this, maybe it's just my mind. Maybe that's not the real Jesus. Mm. And Jesus also said men love darkness rather than light. Mm. Um, and uh, it seems like we want to create a Jesus in our own mind, just like we want to create a God in our own mind. I remember C.S. Lewis saying something like this, that we would, we just want God who's kind of a benevolent old grandfather figure who just wants everybody to have a good time. That's kind of the God yeah. of progressive Christianity, isn't it? It is. And, and that is called uh, therapeutic moralistic deism. Yes. And it's very interesting as I read some of these progressive Christian books, not all, some are more theologically sophisticated than others, but some of the more popular level books, especially the ones aimed at women, it's like there's this deism where God loves you. He just wants you to be happy. Mm. Uh, He's not really all that concerned about who you sleep with or what you're putting into your mind and your heart. But, you know, as long as you're happy, as long as you feel good, as long as you're accepted and affirmed and comfortable, then he's good. But if you need something, he'll be there. So it's essentially the deistic view, like the watchmaker that, that creates the world, winds up the watch and then steps back and basically lets you do what you want in his name. But what is interesting, if, even if you ask a progressive Christian, say about the incarnation, why did Jesus come? They might even say something like, well, he came to experience life as a human, to stand in solidarity with us. I hear that a lot, that Jesus came to stand in solidarity with us. But the point I try to make in the book is that that's only part of the picture. Yes, he did come to experience, and he experienced all of our sufferings and everything that we go through. But in all of this, he was without sin, as the author of Hebrews tells us. And if if he only came to stand in solidarity with us, then he can't save us. And that's mm. that's that's why it's another gospel. It's not a God who can save you. He can stand in solidarity with you, but he's powerless to save you. Yeah, he's powerless to save you. And he also came to bring a sword that's going to divide mother and daughter, father and son. He was just a nice guy. Come on. Right. right. (laughs) Now, we just got a minute to go here, but I do want to direct people, Lisa, to your website. And I I love your little blog, little blog. It's blown up. The one that you wrote a couple of years ago called Girl, Watch Your Face, What Rachel Hollis Gets Right and Wrong. And uh, you have five lies that the progressive Christian movement puts out. Well, really, that Rachel uh, Hollis put out. Uh, And these lies are some of the things we spoke about right here on the show. Like uh, lie, you come first and your happiness depends on you. Lie two, you should never give up on your dreams. Number three, religious pluralism is true. Number four, judgment is bad. So don't judge me. Stop judging me for judging um, sin is not the problem, right? These are all lies that you unpack, at least many of these you unpack in the book, Another Gospel. Now, let people know where they can uh, see you if they want to come see you speak or, and where they can learn more about your ministry and your book and all that. People can find me at my website, alisachilders.com. And from there, they can get connected with my blog and my podcast and my YouTube channel. There's also a tab on the website called Another Gospel with buttons to buy the book basically anywhere. You can buy it anywhere books are sold. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Christian Book. Uh, You can buy it from your local Christian bookstore. It's available everywhere. And yeah, so I just launched my YouTube channel a few months ago, and that's growing. And so I just encourage you to check out the the stuff that I've got on my website at alisachilders.com. You need to check that out, friends. Alisa's the leader in this movement right now to minister to progressive Christians and also to rescue people from uh, going down that road to the cliff of another gospel and almost going off the cliff herself. She reversed course and learned the truth about Christianity and is now 
leading a ministry that ministers to that to, or to those folks. Elisa, thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much, Frank. That's Elisa Childers, ladies and gentlemen, lisachilders.com. Great having her on. And I will see you, Lord willing, next week. God bless. If you benefit from this podcast, help others find it. Just go to iTunes or any other podcast service you might be using to listen and leave us a five-star rating on the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast with Dr. Frank Turek. It will take you less than five seconds. You can also help a lot by leaving us a positive review for others to see. This podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many other audio content delivery apps. Thank you and God bless.